Ron was sent to Borstal, where he met a volatile inmate, John Gillies. Now, Gillies was the sort of person who would have imagined himself as Machine Gun Kelly or something. When he was 16, he was on a boat, a coal boat went to Australia. He got hold of a gun over there and shot at the crew when he was drunk, and they had to disarm him. He was frothing at the mouth then. Jorgensen and Gillies developed a close and dangerous friendship that continued long after Borstal and may be a link to Ron's baffling disappearance. When Ron Jorgensen went missing in 1984, there was speculation that his criminal past had caught up with him, that he'd been murdered and his car dumped off the Kaikoura cliff. He was a self-styled gangster, and he loved the woman that went with it, and the money and the excitement. By his early 20s, Ron Jorgensen had done a stint in prison as well as Borstal. On release from jail, he teamed up with Borstal mate John Gillies. They were dealing in drugs, booze and stolen property, and living up to their gangster reputations. They used to walk around with their big coats on, like American Mafia, you know, with their collars turned up, with the hats over their eyes. And they were involved in uh, smoking marijuana. Before marijuana even became popular amongst the hippies, in the early 60s, they had access to marijuana. But the partnership was heading toward disaster. While Jorgensen enjoyed playing the big-time gangster, Gillies was becoming increasingly unstable, blurring the line between fantasy and reality. And I believe, and I've heard from several, that Gillies was astonished when he actually shot someone. He was still playing, still fantasy. Only this time he didn't roll over from the fantasy and go to sleep in his cell. There he was suddenly on the run with two bodies. It was on December the 4th, 1963, that Gillies and Jorgensen crossed the line. High on marijuana, they drove to 115 Bassett Road in Remuera, intent on settling a score with some criminal rivals. Gillies was armed with a machine gun. They'd had the machine gun on um, single shot. They'd made these people uh, kneel down, uh, Spate and Walker, and uh, they'd shot them dead. Of course, the publicity was immense. It was Chicago comes to Auckland, a rising machine gun smuggled into Auckland and, uh, you know, rival beer houses and gangsters and so forth. It, at the time, it was big news, big news. Four weeks later, Jorgensen and Gillies were arrested for the brutal murders of Kevin Spate and Frederick Walker. Gillies eventually made a confession. Jorgensen steadfastly denied any involvement and was shocked when he too was charged with the murders. There was no evidence that Jorgensen had uh, participated in the shooting. He was charged as an accessory on the basis that he knew uh, that a gun was being taken over. He knew there was ammunition, he knew it was loaded. Uh, and on the principle of law that that made him an accessory uh, and uh, that made him guilty of the murder. That was the Crown case. The pair were found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Jorgensen maintained he was innocent and was bitter that he was taking the rap for what he saw as Gilly's crime. The two soon fell out badly. Jorgie said, I never actually killed Kevin Spate. He said, but I did the time, he said, and I expected that uh, when Gillies was in there that he would have admitted that he was the one that had pulled the trigger. And he said there was bad blood between us. He said, uh, in actual point of fact, what had happened, they'd had a fight in prison and Georgie had urinated over at Gillies. The same month that Ron disappeared, John Gillies was due for release and there were whispers that Gillies would seek revenge for what had happened in prison. But police and most others dismissed this talk as fanciful. Gillies couldn't have hurt him. Jorgensen, except by shooting him. He was a big man, Jorgensen, and he was quite a bit bigger than Dirk Gillies. 
I don't think Gilly's hated Jorgensen to that extent, and I don't think Gilly's had it in him anyway. But Gilly's wasn't Ron's only enemy. While on bail in Kaikoura, Jorgensen had continued to grow and deal dope, and there were rumours he'd fallen out with a local bikey gang. He said his caravan had been broken into, and I went down there and uh, <clears throat> someone had actually kicked the door open on it, and you could see the footprint from them. And there was someone from um, Picton, as I understand it. We heard all sorts of rumours. There was one story we heard that there had been an attempt to run him over uh, 10 days or so before this and that he'd been warned that he was at risk. Well, we, uh, we talked to all his acquaintances and there was never any suggestion of that. He was never going to get away from his criminal background, but on the other hand, I don't think by any means he was, he was into big-time drug dealing at that stage. He wasn't in that high level of offending that would generate any uh, resentment or anything that, that might lead to his murder. In fact, all of the inquiries we made, there was nothing that indicated a motive for his, uh, for his murder. Nevertheless, rumours continued to circulate and six years after Ron's disappearance, the possibility of foul play was raised once again. This was Ronald Jorgensen seven years ago, and this is the reconstruction of a skull some people think may be his. Six years after Ron Jorgensen mysteriously disappeared, the case hit the news once again. This was Ronald Jorgensen seven years ago, and this is the reconstruction of a skull some people think may be his. The shape of the skull matched Ron's measurements, so authorities went to the trouble of commissioning a reconstruction of his head. But the effort was futile. The skull and the skeleton were not Ron Jorgensen's. With no real evidence to support the theory that Ron Jorgensen was murdered, another possibility has to be considered, that he committed suicide. By the time Jorgensen returned to Kaikoura, he'd spent a lifetime in prison fighting a murder conviction and a reputation as a hardened criminal. But while in prison, he displayed new talents. He had remarkable artistic abilities and also he could write. He wrote some beautiful stories for children and illustrated them. Uh, he wrote poetry, he wrote prose, uh, he painted. There was a compassionate side to him. Once you got uh, through that hard external kernel and you got to the inside, it was really quite a gentle side of Jorgensen. I, li I like to be termed as a truthful painter and uh, prison is a very grey place. You get uh, patches of white here and there with uh, dippers and things like that, but basically the colour of prison is grey. After serving 10 years of his life sentence, Ron was granted a release by the parole board. He volunteered to crew on his friend's yacht and reveled in his newfound freedom. And I've never seen a man so happy at sea. He just, just sort of hung from the bloody rigging and laughed and sang just to be out there and the, the freedom and the sky and the clouds and the sea. And I, it was just a pleasure to be with someone who was so happy. What we didn't know, of course, was that um, there was a posse of police who were following us everywhere. But for this artist and infamous murderer, the newfound freedom was short-lived. At that stage, when people came out of prison, they went on a uh, sickness benefit, but the actual funds didn't go in their bank account for something like six to eight weeks. And Ron said that when people came out of jail, they virtually had to go and commit another crime in order to live because they came out without any money. Jorgensen couldn't resist the easy money offered by drug dealing and the police were waiting to pounce. He went back into the criminal lifestyle. He got caught. He got 18 months. But they made him do another five and a half years. He didn't know when he was going to get out. Every time he went up to the parole board, they would give him another knockback. So he'd be doing a series of short six or 12 month census between the parole board. Time of great tension. With his parole revoked, 
there was no limit set on Ron's life sentence. Time and again, his case was heard by the parole board, which recommended his release. But the government stepped in to keep the high-profile Jorgensen behind bars. Jorgensen's life really is the example uh, of a highly intelligent, highly sensitive man being crushed by the penal system. There's nothing worse to do to a person than to offer the little carrot and you think it's there and you think you're going to get it and then just as you get to it they take it away and put it back so the goalposts are constantly changing you're constantly thinking you're going to get out and you're not that really screws your mind up big time and ron would have been terribly bitter about that <laughs> 